what's very true about eyes is that what you look at is what you will focus on. So if you are looking at a whole note for, you know, tied over for seven bars, that's what you'll focus on. You won't hear the oboe, you won't see the conductor slow down, and you'll hear your own sound, but you won't necessarily hear the sounds of your even your other bass players around you. What's it like working with four of the most famous bass teachers all at the same school? How does eye movement affect learning and performing? And why is it that mastering the bow is so crucial for any bass player's development? Welcome to Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I'm so glad to be joined today by Susan Cahill. And Sue is a Chicago native and a graduate of Indiana University, where she studied with Bruce Bransby and Lawrence Hurst, as well as working with Stuart Sankey and Murray Grodner. She's been a member of the Colorado Symphony since 1997, and she teaches at the University of Denver. You'll be hearing clips of Sue playing throughout this episode, including a recent recording of the Vaughn Williams Piano Quintet from Festival Mosaic out here in California. And you can check out the show notes for links to this and everything else that Sue's up to. So we dig into growing up in Chicago, where I lived for many years. Sue and I actually have a ton of interesting shared connections. We also talk about those four bass teams I just mentioned, and some key takeaways from all of them. We've got some great sponsors for this episode, Upton Bass, A440, and the Bass Violin Shop. Maybe we can just start with, like, how'd you get into music? How did I get into music? Oh, wow. Okay. I, I actually, I just heard the piece the other day. Um, my mother was a pianist, and I'm standing in, in San Luis Obispo, you know, before rehearsal, and we have the radio on, and on comes um, one of the list concert etudes, which is, I think it's the second one. Beautiful, beautiful piece. And I heard that piece, and whenever I hear that piece, that's, that's what reminds me of how I got into music, because she would play it on the piano. And so I just wanted to play piano. There was no stopping me. And so I started piano when I was four. And piano is, is my first instrument. And I played piano and organ all through college. That's really what got me started. And I, and I loved piano. And in my family, every kid played two, two instruments. And my sisters were older than me. Um, and they played Suzuki violin, and I just could not stand listening to them scratch away on the violin. I couldn't stand. I wanted to get as far away from the violin as I as I possibly could. So, I mean, now I have a much different opinion of violin, but back then it was pretty bad. So I wanted to play drums, but my mother said, nope, nope, you can play piano and one other instrument, and it can't be drums. It's It's kind of funny. She sort of chose bass for me in a way because I was going to have all this, all these braces, and she's like, oh, you know, wind instruments, that'd be a bad idea. So, so she said, you know, bass, there's not many female bass players. My mother was very um, forward-thinking and pragmatic, and she said, there's not many female bass players, and I bet you there's lots of scholarships for bass players. <laughs> 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 so I started playing bass, and the thing, the thing that got me really interested in it is that all of a sudden, you know, as a pianist, uh, up until the age of 10, I wasn't playing in community. You know, I didn't have a community of people to play with, and all of a sudden I did. And I think that's what really kept me interested because as in those days, you know, bass for a 10-year-old was kind of hard. There weren't as many itty-bitty basses around. The strings weren't as technologically advanced. It was, it was pretty hard to start out on bass as a 10-year-old female. But playing with other people was what kept me going. So, yeah, and then just the usual route in Chicago, which was you know, Evanston Township High School Orchestra and Youth Symphonies, Glymphony, Joe Glimp's Orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Glymphony. Oh, wow. Glymphony. I haven't heard that word in a while. That's great. <laughs> Glymphony, yep. Yeah. And Suwannee Summer Music uh, Camp because Joe was, was associated with that. So I'd go up with my friends to that. We, took, we, we, we rode the, One year we rode the Greyhound all together, just us, just the teenagers on the Greyhound and created havoc. So yeah, it, it's, it, it was really the community mindedness of the instrument that, that got me really interested in and playing in these beautiful places in downtown Chicago, playing at the Harold Washington Library, 
you know, where you have the lake behind you and the and the birds flying as you're playing, you know, Pines of Rome or and Joe Joe picked amazing repertoire. That was one of his strong points for that youth orchestra is that he picked the stuff that he knew was going to keep kids interested um, and keep them really enthused. So, um, and, you know, we had that sort of uh, competition with the other youth orchestra. Was it, is it, what is it called? The Chicago Youth Symphony or something like that, where a bunch of my other friends were in that one. It was this sort of like nutrier Evanston Township rivalry that went on between those two orchestras. But I really, I really appreciated Joe's approach a lot more. It was, I think the word I would look at for that would be friendlier. It was a friendlier approach. He was very supportive. He was a great mentor to all of us. Uh, you know, a super nice guy. Got us hooked up with Swanee and um, and Nathan Kahn, who was the teacher up there at Swanee at the time. So um, yeah, so that's kind of how it all started. And then I just there's just nothing else I ever wanted to do. There was no plan B, not a single thought of a plan B. I think my parents were thinking there should be a plan B, but um, but there for me there really wasn't. There's this great old building in Chicago called the Fine Arts Building. It's in the loop on Michigan Avenue, just south of Chicago's Symphony Center. And it's got these great old-timey pulley elevators with actual human elevator operators. And this is where Sue would rehearse with the classical symphony. You rehearsed on the 10th floor, probably, Curtis Hall, because Chicago Symphony is on, Youth Symphony is on the 8th floor. Wow. Did those rehearsals overlap ever, the, the two oh, orchestras? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There was dust-ups in the break rooms, man, and downstairs at that little cafe. Not really dust-ups, but just, you know, you know, we were, were all eyeballing each other. Yeah, and that we, I remember, like, stealing the elevator. Like, the guy would go off for a little coffee break, and then we'd get in that elevator and ride it around, which <laughs> we, were, we were pretty... <laughs> I think we were, Glimpany seemed to us like, and this was cool for us, it seemed to us like kind of like the um, the JD orchestra, you know, the Juvenile Delinquent Orchestra a little bit. I'm not sure if that's really true, but that's how we felt, which we were really proud of. Anyway, so it was it was a great, and then, you know, I joined Civic in high school as well, um, towards the end of my high school years. And that was another sort of big uh, development for me because that was a whole different class of people. How many high schoolers were in Civic at the time? Not many. Um, and I was in it. I remember it was sort of the beginning. No, no, no. That was when I rejoined. I rejoined when I moved back to town. Beginning was Michael Morgan. And then when I rejoined, when I moved back, it, oh gosh, it might have still been Michael Morgan. I can't remember. But I clearly remember being in rehearsals with people like Daniel Barenboim. We did a, a Last Movement of Mahler 9 with Pierre Boulez, which was amazing. I mean, it was such, growing up in that town as a musician was such an amazing opportunity. I mean, the radio station WFMT to be surrounded by that. Um, it was really just an amazing education, I have mm. to say. We also dig into Sue's decision to attend Indiana University, and we'll dig into this topic. It's a great topic in a lot more detail later in the episode. How did you discover Indiana? How did that come on your radar? Oh, well, you know, when, when I was um, getting ready to graduate, my piano teacher was a very uh, famous pedagogue in Chicago, and she had gone to Eastman. Um, she's actually descendant of a, of a Schnabel, like Schnabel, like, you know, once removed from Arthur Schnabel student. And she really wanted me to go to Eastman. So I auditioned for Eastman um, with, with James Vandermark, who had probably just about started there. And I got a great deal, a good, you know, ride there. But but James is, you know, German bow and I'm French. So that was one thing. The other thing is that I went to uh, I, I went to IU and I auditioned for Stuart Sankey and Murray Grodner, who were still there at that time. It was their last year. And I just had a great feeling about the school and about those two characters. Um, <laughs> and they really were characters. So it really was just between those two schools. And Indiana is so different from Chicago. Uh, I think that was the other thing that appealed to me. It was this sort of cloistered environment. Um, you know, there was no L in sight, you know, <laughs> or no rumbling buses. It was a small town. Um, and I liked, I really liked that idea and I got along well. And of course they gave me, you know, nice bags of money. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the other important thing. I mean, I, I got out of that school not in debt, which is an amazing thing. Um, it was much less expensive to live there too but um but yeah but Stuart and and Murray were I was only there uh one year before they both left 
Stuart went to um, Michigan and, and Murray pretty much retired. So I only got one year of those guys, um, save a summer at Aspen with, with Stuart Sankey. And then Bruce Bransby and Larry Hurst came. So that was another whole different type of education from those guys. So after I got done, I just sort of was out of the energy. It was very intense. I had gone to Aspen, you know, many years. I, by that time, I'd been there at least two years, I think. And I just didn't feel like I had had the gumption to, to start a master's. So I went back to Chicago. And of course, I had a place, a cool place to go back to, you know, that I knew that the freelance opportunities were going to be there. I think if you're from a, a smaller town and you think, oh, I got to go be with my parents because I'm not going to do a master's, and you're somewhere in Iowa, that's not a good choice. But I knew I was going back to this city that I knew and I had connections there. So I go back to Chicago and I start, you know, trying to get myself worked into the into the scene. And I do Northwest Indiana and I do Elgin and you know, all those things that you're familiar with. And I start getting in with Arnie, which of course is the brass ring uh, at the time, at least it was, of of gigging and with Cliff Colnett. So, and I, I was fairly happy doing that for a while and still taking auditions, but this was the last recession. So this was the early nineties and it was month after month of no jobs in the paper. Baby boomers were still, you know, young enough. They were holding on to their jobs. The recession was there. There was, there was nothing. So when it was finally time to kind of get out of Chicago, I saw an opening for um, Louisiana Phil and decided I'd go down there an audition, which I did, and I got that job. So I just made the move down there because I realized that freelancing in Chicago it wasn't maybe going to make me the happiest. I know people have, have loved it and had great times there. I, you obviously dug it for a while. John Tuck, who's still there, I think. Um, lots of other folks, you know. I just, But I just figured, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I can't do this game forever. So I went down to New Orleans and joined that orchestra at the time. Uh, it was a, Klaus Peter Zeibel was there, and Caitlin Kaminga was in the bass section there, and she's, you know, fabulous. Then she left to go to, I believe, Hong Kong, and then I auditioned for principal and got that job. And then I stayed there until uh, Dave came, and then it was uh, time to, to move on and took the audition for Colorado and got that in 97. So I didn't stay there terribly long, but I loved I loved living there. Can you talk a bit about what you did at ISB uh, this summer? What oh, your sure. session was on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I um, I did a session of of almost all my own music. Gosh, you know, ISB is so full of great bass recitals of things like you know the first suite and sonatas and stuff like that. I, I knew I didn't want to do that, and I'm I'm really. Um, focusing more on composition in, in terms of uh, my bass playing these days. So it was all my own music with the exception of I, I did failing because that's kind of like one of my party tricks. <laughs> well, lamp sh lampshade on the head. You know, I've, I've done it many times and so I, I, and I've gotten gotten pretty solid at it. And so it's kind of fun to, to watch people's eyes bug out of their head. But yeah, so so the one of the things we did that I, I was really excited about was uh, I wrote a piece with an improvisational actor called... Uh, Sonata for double bass and iTunes user agreement. <laughs> and yeah, and, and so I've been working with this good friend of mine, John Wilkerson, who's an improvisational actor. Uh, he also teaches business, but that's another thing that he does. And we just were coming up with, we wanted to work together and we came up with this arcane idea. Like, you know, mainly he came up with the idea of using that text. We were going to do text and improv together. And, and he thought, okay, well, what about this text? I mean, have you read it? And so we both read it. It's like 50 pages long of, of the biggest lawyeries gobbledygook you'd ever want to read in your life. And us having, you know, sense of humor like that sort of bent and warped, we thought, oh, this is perfect. This is perfect. So we, we chose some selections from it, you know, some brief uh, segments that were really arcane. Uh, some of it just very technical. Some of it just bizarre when you read it out of context. And some of it just bizarre anyway. And... We, we have about five sections of it, and I, my part is completely improvised. So, and I have different styles of improv depending on what, what he's reading. Some of it is like, uh, you know, I work right along with him and I try and mimic his sounds. Some of it is playing off of him. Some of it is in, in contrast to him. So all the typical improvisational techniques. And it's, it's quite funny and also quite disturbing. There's like some NSA character stuff to it that's really very disturbing. So we're going to do it again out, out in California next summer, which I'm very excited about. And it, it, it went over really well. John John is a fearless person, and that's when you're doing improv, that's what you need. So we did that. And then the other music that I write uh, is very much jazz-inspired. Uh, I have a great uh, sort of, I call him a guru, mentor I work with in Boulder uh, named Art Landy. 
Uh, he's a he's a jazz pianist uh, who's pretty famous in the jazz world, very famous in the jazz world. So he's been helping me develop um, my ideas. Um, so I did um, a few of my jazz, standard jazz tar- charts. And then I did, a, I kind of call it an art song. Uh, it's called June, February, and it's for soprano. So it's for soprano voice, operatic trained voice, but the then the chord structure underneath it is jazz based. So it's just chord structure uh, underneath that. Um, with text that I wrote. So that was that was the bulk of it. Yeah, I, I wrote a tune called T-Neck that um, sort of a bebop inspired tune. And yeah, it was really, and the pianist I had was awesome. Uh, it's just a great experience. Sue spent time working with four of the most well-known bass teachers of the last half century. Stuart Sankey, Murray Grodner, Lawrence Hurst, and Bruce Bransby. And I simply had to ask her, since I was chatting with her, about details about what it was like studying with them. Similarities, differences, takeaways, and that kind of thing. Before we dive into that, I'd like to give a shout out to Upton Bass. So glad to have them on board with the podcast. And I want to let you know about their Concord model, which is basically... A Prescott. They took several gaba shaped Prescotts and copied them from the upper corners down. But Upton knew that if the Prescott shape was to be viable today, the ergonomics needed to be dealt with, the really big bases. So Upton incorporated some elements of the car model into that classic Prescott form. It takes all of your attention when they're building it, the Upton folks tell me. And so it's only available as a completely solid wood base. And they copied Scott LaFaro's Prescott F-holes on the model, but kept them on cut to pay homage to Prescott. Check them out online at UptonBase.com, and thanks for sponsoring the show. I'd also like to give a shout out to the A440 Violin Shop. Brings back memories of my couple decades in Chicago. I can't even begin to tell you how many times I took my own bass to A440 to get some work done. Or I told a student, you got to check out A440. You got to check out the instruments they have, the bows they have, the quality work they do. I've been a fan for a long time. If you are in the Midwest or passing through Chicago, do yourself a favor, stop by A440, just west of Wrigley Field on Roscoe, beautiful Roscoe Village. Check them out online at A440ViolinShop.com. Okay, let's dig into what it was like studying with these four prominent bass teachers. So, yeah, so you just named like four of the biggest names in bass pedagogy right there, right? In like right. One sec- so, <laughs> so it would just be fascinating. And we could talk about this for hours. So, you know, feel free to just but like maybe just like a little bit about maybe we could start with like Murray Grodner and Stuart Sankey. What were those guys like as teachers? Like what were, do you, do you uh, what do you remember about your, your time with them? Oh gosh, I, you know, I, I remember a lot about both of them. Murray was uh, Mr. Groder. He's still alive. If he hears this, he'd probably be mad at me that I'd calling him Murray. Um, <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> he's such a lovely guy. He was incredibly firm, but in this in this way that you knew uh, he had your best interests in heart. He had he had his methodology down. He knew how to solve any particular problem. I remember one lesson. We were working on the last movement of Mozart 35. He's like, you know, I'm going to show you how to play this, and you're gonna, it's going to be great, and you're gonna, you're gonna think it's the most wonderful thing you ever heard. And he proceeded to play it, and it sounded awesome. He just ripped it off, and I'm like, oh wow, that was cool. How'd you do that? And he said, okay, I want you to watch closely again. Okay, watch it, because I was, I don't know what I was watching, but I wasn't watching the right thing. So he does it again, and I realize he's he's just using one finger, one <laughs> finger. <laughs> okay, it must have been forty because thirty-five would have been too hard with one finger. But one finger. Wow. And he said, what does that? What does that tell you? 
And I'm like, uh, I guess it's all about the bow. And he's like, bingo. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what fingering you use. I don't care what fingering you use. But you need to make sure that your bow, your bow arm is as smart as it can possibly be. And he was really big about the Zimmerman book, you know, the bow, the bow book, um, mm-hmm. the, the big red book. Mm-hmm. He was huge into that. And, and I have used that right arm, you know, intelligence theories of his ever since, mm-hmm. you know, right arm alone practice. So he, he, you know, he was just marvelous. He could be, you know, he could be pretty uh, stern and firm, but he was also just fun. And Stuart was fun in a completely different way because as people have told stories about him, you know, he's a completely, um, you know, kind of a goofy guy, but dead serious about a lot of stuff. And his teaching style was much more um, open-ended. He was much more curious about what solutions you were going to come up with for bowing and for fingering. But for musically, he was he was always there with guidance. He's like, oh, you know, musically, that just doesn't seem to make sense. He's like, you could play it like that, but that's how bass players play it. Why don't you try playing it like this, which is how other string players play it. So I really got that sense from him that he wanted people to, to elevate. And, of course, that's true of, of, of the music he edited. He edited all that music for us because he really, like, I remember he it talks about that in the in the Applebaum book. He really thought the Hindemith Sonata was like bottom drawer Hindemith. He didn't think it was a very good piece. And, you know, he's right, actually. So to him, it really made sense to stop trying to, you know, put lipstick on a pig with some of these pieces and just to create our own uh, approach to real, what he considered real music. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciated that. And that's still... You know, a tenant. And he, he's also the one who told me when I got into New World, he's like, ah, you don't need that place. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that was the right advice at the time uh, because, of course, lots of great players come out of New World. But I, I remember him saying that, that to me when we were in Aspen together. So, yeah, so they, they, were, uh, they were characters. And then, you know, when Bruce and, and Larry got there, they're much different aesthetics, um, especially Bruce. Not so much Larry. I think Larry was really trained more in the old... New York style, uh, Eastern Coast style of of Stuart and and Murray, but Bruce is a totally different animal, which I definitely appreciated as well. Yeah, and and I'd love to how how and I've interviewed Bruce before, and I've taken lessons with Bruce, and great guy and get, amazing mm-hmm. player and teacher. But like, how how was he different for you when you started to work with him? How was he different than those other three? Well, um, he didn't he didn't joke around much. When you got him to laugh, you knew you did something well. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> He didn't joke around much. I mean, the thing that's, that's important to understand about Bruce, I think, I just saw him a few days ago, actually, I was up in Aspen. He, he feels this tremendous responsibility when he's educating people that they get employment. Mm-hmm. You know, he's not one of those people who says, well, music is great for everybody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach them. I'm going to make sure they, you know, understand and love music. And the universe will take care of whether or not they actually make a living at this. That is not how he thinks. You know, he he is bound and determined. It, 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 I've heard him say, it, you know, if I'm taking these kids' parents' money. You know, we're taking their money. We should give them something of value for that. And and his mm-hmm. record speaks for it. In all the students he's had that have gotten jobs, he is he is very focused on that. And and beca- as a result, he can be pretty tough. Like if he thinks what you're doing will not get you a job, he will tell you. Mm-hmm. Um, and no, with without any varnish whatsoever. <laughs> And I appreciate that, and I've definitely uh, taken some of that in in my, my teaching style as well. I joke with my colleague uh, Jeremy in the in my section. You know, we joke about Bruce saying things like, "Well, you know, you could do that fingering, or you could get a job." Yeah. You know, that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know that line. I love, I love, I love, I love that. Which that is, line. you know, completely different, especially from how Sankey operated. You know, a whole different thing. But Bruce, being of a bit younger generation, when you know, the Ford Foundation wasn't propping up orchestras left and right, knew that it was much harder to get a job and that he needed to combine, you know, both things to make sure kids were employed. And I really respect that. I really do. And Larry um, had the, actually had the same same impetus, but he had a much more, um, uh, he, he kind of delivered whatever a student seemed to need. You know, he sort of figured out what they needed and then delivered his approach that way. Mm-hmm. Whereas Bruce's approach is Bruce's approach. And if you're not cool with it, that's fine. But, you know, you maybe go seek a different teacher. So I, I appreciated both of them because they both had that, those opposite kind of strengths. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad to see you all here tonight. It's such an honor to be here with you all. 
And <coughs> you've probably surmised that I'm Sue Cahill. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about why I'm here, what's going to happen, so that you all feel comfortable. We don't want anyone to get hurt. <laughs> Scott Yu asked me to help with this program, to curate this concert a, a while back. And I thought, well, you know, that's a really, uh, a really lovely uh, thought. I was very honored. Um, I think one of the reasons he asked me is being a bass player, we're, we are often asked to do a lot of different things. You know, most genres of music um, have the lowest bass line in it, of course, and it's usually played by a double bass or an electric bass. And so we grow up, when we play this instrument, we grow up doing all kinds of, of different things. We play in jazz bands and all that other sorts of stuff. And I myself play tango as well. Um, I write songs, I play a little bit of jazz, I do a whole bunch of different things. So I think he thought that, that it would be good for me to come up with a, a program for you. And I thought, well, you know, a good way to start would be to show you a little bit about uh, some of the things that the bass does that, that really are very uh, non-traditional. We have a lot of people writing music for us because we don't have the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, we don't have the Dvorak. So we get composers writing new pieces for us all the time. And it's really a, a great honor to be here and to play this type of music for you because you've probably never heard something, something like this. Because in failing, I'm required to read a long text while playing music written above the text. <laughs> and the text must be read out loud at more or less a normal pace. And I must not allow the music to slow me down. And the task is fairly easy for a while because there is not much music and most of it comes at the ends of clauses and sentences, almost like normal punctuation. Later on, there's more music and the task becomes more difficult so difficult, in fact, that I will probably not be able to do it without slowing down my reading. Sue has some great teaching concepts that we dig into about the bow arm, an important topic for sure, and also about eye movement and how it affects learning. This eye movement concept has stuck with me ever since this conversation. I've been actually using it in my own lessons these past few weeks. It's very cool. Before we finish up with this last part, I'd like to thank our last sponsor, which is the Bass Violin Shop. Located in North Carolina, they are the place to go for bassists in the Southeast. And they offer professional setups, repairs, and restorations at reasonable prices. They go beyond their customers' expectations with setups that are meticulous, they're friendly, they're helpful, they have highly skilled luthiers, and they've all got one common goal in mind, and that is making their customers happy with whatever bass they happen to play. So if you have an open seam or you need a top-off restoration, those are the two extremes, right? They can take care of you. They're there to help you through the process. Check them out online at BassViolinShop.com. Okay, here we go with the final part of our conversation with Sue, all about teaching. I actually just put out this podcast episode all about bow strokes, and it was oh, go yeah. going back and listening back to everything I'd put out basically in like everybody, all these different people talking about the right arm and the importance right. of the right arm. And I started off with a quote from Lawrence Hurst about, <laughs> <laughs> about wow. how the right arm is typically two years behind the left oh, arm, oh, yeah. you know, in turn, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. like, I, I like how, how do you, and again, I love these big questions, so apologies in advance, but like how, you mentioned the Zimmerman book, the A and E book, I like to call it, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, right. How do you approach, uh, let's just say, how do you approach teaching right arm bowing concepts with your students? Like uh, how does that process work for you? Well, you know, I do this big amalgam of stuff because I've taken lessons with Paul uh, before, Paul Ellison too. And then I have this other sort of New York, Base training, and then I have this LA base training, and so it's uh, you know it's a big amalgam. But one of the things I like to start with is Paul's exercise, his anticipatory exercise that that, that he teaches, which is basically trying to figure out how to make your right arm go one direction while the rest of your body goes another direction when you're getting ready for a bow change. And it's really a fabulous exercise that he taught to me lots of years ago um, that I keep teaching, especially the students who are just new to me or or young students. And I find that really helps. It's It stops things like that, you know, uh, the aggressive flip from happening too much. <laughs> so that's where it starts for me is making sure the student understands that concept. And depending on what kind of body intelligence the student has, 
I can tell pretty early on how quickly they're going to achieve other concepts. Because if they can do that, it's a, you know, I live in the West, so we, I talk about it sometimes in terms of skiing. You know, you, you point your skis downhill, but when you want to turn left, you start turning your upper body first, and then the, the skis follow. And it's the same thing with at the end of a down bow. When you're, when you're getting ready, especially if you're doing a long, loud passage, if you're getting ready to go up bow, you need to start moving the rest of your body up bow before the right arm does. And that makes the smoothest bow changes. So that's always where it starts for me. And then, you know, getting into the strokes that create, you know, that have less bow, I'm a big fan of, of students um, knowing exactly where the bow changes are, making up their own Zimmerman exercise for whatever piece they're playing, writing it out on staff paper, you know, uh, above in the, you know, G-D-A-E, what the bow changes are. And then right below, inst- and I'm big on eye movement, so this is a big thing for me, making sure right below it, in, uh, lined up perfectly, are the actual notes so that they can take in and with their eye as they're doing the, you know, the, the right arm alone exercise, they can really track what it's eventually going to be uh, on the page with the actual notes. And I find that, you know, in complex passages in any Mozart, a lot of Beethoven, if their right arm knows exactly where it is in time and space and where it's supposed to go, it's so much easier. Like Larry says, if it's two years behind. And so you and, and people just tend to think, well, I'll just keep working my left hand and then the right arm will catch up. And it just doesn't work that way. It just it just doesn't. They need to be put on the same level. Uh, ideally from the time they're a young person but if I have found that it's possible to catch students up if their right arm is behind it, it and it really just depends on the body intelligence you know how naturally coordinated they are so I do a lot of that I've, I've had some luck with you know Hal's book stroke and it's a little dry I found for for some students I, I guess I'm I, I take after Larry in the sense that I like to tailor the exercises to what the particular student needs and make sure that they that it it works for them. The the eye movement concept is interesting. Like like, can you elaborate on that? How does? Uh, uh, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> another big that's another big topic. I'm a nut about eye movement. I really am. So you know, like I said, I started out as a pianist, and sight reading and eye movement are much more important in in piano music uh, because there's so many notes flying by. And what I found as I got more into bass and, and more into teaching is that there's a real deficit in a lot of bass players who don't have a background in piano or music that goes by quickly a lot of the time, like violin, they tend to use their eyes very inefficiently and, and tend to be some of the poor sight readers uh, of, of an orchestra. What happens, too, is, is, uh, is they get to be musically a little behind also because they, they have this need to stare at the page. And, and what's very true about eyes is that what you look at is what you will focus on. So if you are looking at a whole note for, you know, tied over for seven bars, that's what you'll focus on. You won't hear the oboe. You won't see the conductor slow down. And you'll hear your own sound, but you won't necessarily hear the sounds of your even your other bass players around you. And I've seen this time and time again in orchestras where I can tell that the person is just really tracking exactly what they're playing while they're playing it, and it shuts out everything around them. So I do a lot of exercises with my young students uh, where I, I use a, what the pianists have been doing forever and ever, I use an index card. And I say, okay, I'm going to cover what you're playing and force your eye to be ahead. Because the brain is an amazing computer. It can do two things at once. You know, it can play a whole note and look ahead at the eighth notes in the next bar. But because bass players don't encounter a lot of super fast music often enough, we get into these sort of lazy eye ruts of just staring at whole notes. We also get into the lazy rut of just only looking horizontally, horizontally, and not looking vertically. I was trying to mash horizontal and vertical in the same word. <laughs> Horizontically. It's, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good, new word. It's a good word. <laughs> it's a new word. So they really only look horizontally across the page. And, and that's why bass players musically end up being, uh, especially in chair music, you know, so there's such a bias against a lot of bass players in chair music because they catch things, they catch on too slowly. You know, a, a dynamic change, a gesture change. There's no conductor. And so now they're really staring at the page. And, you know, I teach chamber music in the summer in Colorado Springs. So I've definitely, this is one of the key things I have to get the students doing really fast is to learn to get off the page. And I use the, the card and I just, it, it's basically, it's, it's about short-term memory, improving your short-term memory, knowing what the eye is capable of seeing at one time and knowing what it isn't capable of seeing, learning how to watch shapes like pianists do instead of individual notes. 
And of course, that assumes that you know your chromatic scales and you know your arpeggios and you know the different shapes. So I really like to get them while they're young with this eye movement stuff because it's, it's, I find it to be incredibly hard to change people's habits uh, later on. What do you recommend people do like in their own practice time to, to develop that skill? Like etudes or what, what do you recommend? No, you know, it's really simple. It's really simple to do on your own. The, the, and, and this is I found to be true. All it takes is to do it slowly. So let's say you're you're doing a passage uh, that you keep messing up in Beethoven seven, you know, the, the in the first movement. Okay, so maybe you you only look one group ahead, you know, you you know you're playing the first one and then you look at the second one. It does not matter how fast you do it. All that matters is that your eye is continuously chosen the next group ahead and. It, it's tricky when I'm when I'm teaching this to students. I'm I'm watching their eyes on the page, and I'm trying to suss out how much material they can actually take in, you know, at one time. Because if you move the card too fast, then they get flustered and they stop doing it, and their short-term memory short circuits, and they can't remember what what it is they're supposed to be playing. So while I'm doing this with them, I'm I'm doing it very very consciously to make sure I'm only giving them the um, amount of material they can do, and then until they learn to do that for themselves. To me, it's like you can practice it slowly. You never have to speed it up. It it kind of speeds itself up automatically. It does not one. Of the, I'm not a big fan of one dial, you know, one click on the metronome at a time anyway, but it really isn't necessary for this. It's hard. That's why that's why I like to get them young because I find there's a lot of resistance to people practicing this slowly with this approach the older they get. My young students, I have a young girl who's um, uh, Bailey Amspoke who's uh, 15 and I've been, you know, I've been making her do this since she was seven. And so now, you know, she she plays monster piece. She plays a Franck Sonata, you know, from memory. Um, it's just, it's a memory tool. And, it, and, and if you do it slowly enough, you'll memorize the piece too. And then I also make sure um, they test themselves. It's very, very important to do these mini quizzes when you're doing this. To do this, do it for half a line, and then quiz yourself and see if you can see the notes go by as your eyes are closed and you play it, again, as slowly as you need to. So it's a very, um, it's based on, you know, educational concepts that, that make sure that people do these little quizzes. Um, they test themselves so that it starts to encode into long-term memory, move from short-term to long-term. Sue, thank you so much for chatting. I really appreciate it. It was great to see you at ISB and connect there. And I love what you're up to, your story, your journey. Super exciting. And I love all those shared connections. Growing up in Evanston, I lived in Evanston for a really long time. Chicago Civic Orchestra, Sue was even playing a lot of the same gigs that I was playing for a long time. So very cool. Check out links in the show notes to everything that we were covering. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I love doing this. It is fun. It gives me so much uh, inspiration. I learn so much, like I was talking about, with that teaching concept, the eye movement. I've been doing that with my bass students, and it's fascinating. I think that I'm, I think I'm giving much better lessons, actually, just after that one conversation. And I never know when I'm going to get a takeaway like that with one of these episodes. That's what's so exciting to me about doing this. And maybe this is your first episode. Maybe this is your 390th episode. But either way, Thank you. So great to connect with you here. And there are lots of ways for you to connect with what we're doing in this global double bass community. First of all, ContrabassConversations.com. That's the website. And that will lead you through the archives. You can get the app there. Yes, we have an app. If you have an iPhone, if you have an Android phone, if you have a Kindle uh, tablet, apps for all of those. It's free, of course, and it's got some bonus content. So pick that up. Uh, you can also connect with us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, wherever you like to hang out. We are there, or hopefully we're there. And the number one thing you can do if you want to help this operation grow and thrive is share this episode. You may think that most bass players listen to this show and a lot of bass players do listen to this show, but I guarantee you it has well under 50% of the global community. And the more people that we can connect with, the more ideas we can get to bring shows that are valuable to you. That's what it's all about. 
So share this on Facebook, share it on Twitter, email it to a friend, tell a friend, tell a student, tell a colleague. Have you listened to Contrary's Conversations? Check it out. Sue Cahill was a great guest. Listen to that, slash Sue Cahill, or Susan Cahill. If you put anybody's name, slash whoever, a guest, they'll pop up. So you can search on the website or you can do that. Thank you so much for connecting, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.